Why do you think so many professionals, business owners, entrepreneurs, especially fitness entrepreneurs, undervalue themselves? They charge less. They undercharge what they're worth. Well, they so <clears throat> for some it is a it is an actual personal esteem issue, um, and, and that exists. And by the way, it exists even in people you would not expect it to exist in. So relatively successful people still often underprice, underfee. Um, um, so for some it's that. For some it is a complete misunderstanding mm -hmm. of price and how price really works in the marketplace. Um, and so many feel that by being timid about price, mm -hmm. by being low in price, uh, by compromising price, that, that, that they are going to, it's an old Lucille Ball show joke to date myself, that they are going to make that up in volume. And rarely is that the case. And so there's a misunderstanding really of how price works, and that's different than undervaluing yourself or what it is that you do. The value issue about price really is delinking, it's about delinking oneself from product and service. So in your world, in the fitness world, and in many professional practices, people, the industry norms are to think about dollars for hours, mm -hmm. are to think about what lawyers would call billable hours, right? Rather than about outcomes, right? So in the weight loss industry, some companies have learned to actually price by the number of pounds you wish to lose. So, wow. <clears throat> so it really doesn't matter hours. Yeah. Um, we have a, we have a member who runs medical clinics um, treating uh, erectile dysfunction. Okay. So um, that is historically dollars for hours office visit treatment program. Mm -hmm. um, they are at about eight times the average treatment program fee very successful. Um, single clinic will do 350 to a million dollars a year. Wow. And they price now totally by outcome. So the conversation with the gentleman at time of price is, how many times a week do you wish to have sex? Um, and by the way, they do not encourage him to call home and get another opinion because the number might be different. Um, how many times a week would you like to have sex? Fine, that's the number of treatment vials you need for the next 12 months. Here's your box, here's your price. Wow. Okay. So, and, and really they're right because whether it takes one office visit or 15 office visits, what difference does it make? Uh, we want the outcome. Yeah. We don't really want the time. We don't really, I mean really, if you can get me fit and you can take another 10 pounds off of me and give me abs of steel and you yeah. can do it in, in one hour a week or four hours a week, I'd actually rather pay more for the one hour mm -hmm. than pay by the hour for the four. I want the outcome. Right. I don't really want the time. Sure. I mean, so, so the, the valuing is really people, to, people get trapped into a business pricing model that they see common in an industry or profession, and any version of the billable hours model is really commoditizing, first of all. So it's going to suppress fee and price automatically. It completely ignores the issue of who is delivering the hours, right? Which makes a big difference, can make a big difference. Um, and it really has nothing to do with what the consumer wants. So the consumer prices it that way and thinks about it that way because you price it that way mm -hmm. and make them think about it that way. Right? I mean, we taught prepay in chiropractic 30 years ago, and chiropractic then and now is still about office visit pricing. So if you're going to come in 10 times and it's $19 an office visit, and we sold 30 years ago based on outcome. So okay, you can't walk. Six weeks from now, you're going to be dancing. Results, right? There. And here's the fee. Yeah. And now, here's what's going to happen in order to make that fee possible. In a world when the average office visit was probably 12 to $13, oh, 
our docks were averaging eighty, ninety dollars if you went back and right. calculated out the treatment program. So there's always really one of three, two of three, or three issues. There's the person's own belief system mm -hmm. about themselves, price, money, value, the marketplace, mm -hmm. what the market will bear, um, which in every category, prices are all over the place. People, so people will say, oh, everybody in our community is cheap, is poor. Really? Therefore, we go out on that street, we better not see a single car that isn't a Kia, all right? Because you can't buy a cheaper car. So if everybody is buying by price, yeah. and they are only buying the cheapest alternatives, mm -hmm. then we better not see anything parked on the street but a Kia. No Hyundais, no Kias. There you go. Tw 20 years ago, it would have been a Yugo. <laughs> um, uh, and there better be no store but Walmart. Yeah. Don't be showing me any store that exists but a Walmart, and there better not be any restaurant but a McDonald's. So let's get in a car and drive around, right? You're, you're immediately wrong. And so in every category, you know, there's a budget tell, there's a Four Seasons, there's a Ritz-Carlton, there's everything in between. We're in Orlando. Disney is the less, least democratic about price of anybody maybe in the world. A, they understand price elasticity. They are not shy or timid about price. Mm -hmm. And they have tiered pricing in almost everything. They have really expensive Disney resorts. Within the resort, they have a concierge floor. Within the concierge floor, they have special things only people on the concierge floor can buy and do. They have regular pass. They have express pass. A lot of people don't know they have private guides, which, yeah. by the way, if you've never done it, <laughs> it'll spoil you forever, but that's the way to do Disney, which is between $195 and $295 an hour, six-hour minimum, wow. private guide for a party of eight. It, it changes the entire experience. Yeah. And they're booked out six months ahead of time all the time. They can't have enough guides. They, you know. So there's a range of price mm -hmm. for everything. There are customers for every price. And so people just really, they don't understand any of that in many cases. And they're handicapping themselves by projecting their own attitudes about price onto the marketplace and onto their customers in many respects like we project human intelligence onto our dogs, right? And we think the dog thinks like we do and mm -hmm. we can talk to it and it comprehends words and it, you know, dogs have intelligence but they don't have that kind of intelligence. But we right. project ourselves onto our dogs. All the time, we, yeah. we, we project our belief system about money as a whole, about prosperity as a whole, about price as a whole, about price in our industry, we project that onto the marketplace and onto the customers for good or evil, for help or harm. Mm -hmm. Then the second category is people don't understand how price works, and they don't understand how price strategy works, and they don't understand presentation of price, they don't understand price elasticity. You know, so that gets in their way and, and, and harms them substantially. Yeah. It definitely does. Good cost. I mean, the, pro the product and the quality speak for itself. You always hear people say, you need to have a better attitude, or where's your positive attitude? But you say attitude is not enough. It's about behavior. I know some pretty cynical, pessimistic, very productive rich people. <laughs> right? Yeah. Now, it, arguably, maybe they would be even richer um, if they had a more optimistic, uplifting, etc. However, I can assure you that thinking alone, it is the flaw in the Hill book title, that thinking alone does not make it so. And I can assure you from personal experience, I can assure you from empirical evidence, I can assure you. And so there is this sort of nonsense and it surfaces and is popularized. There's a wave of it every so often. Probably the most recent big mainstream wave was all around a documentary called The Secret. Yes. And uh, Rhonda Byrne put that together, a metaphysical book. I'll, I have no objection to it, um, and several of my friends were in it. Hmm. However, so it is accurate to a fault of omission. Mm -hmm. Its implication, and the implication that people draw from it, is sort of where you went. So if my business is not doing well, if I just thought better 
and I put out better thoughts mm -hmm. that magnetically I would attract all that I need. Another version of that is if I'm just a really good person, yeah. I, I will attract all that I need. This, first of all, reveals a lack of understanding of how money works. So money actually has a mind of its own. Mm -hmm. So if money only flowed to places of worthy merit, most people would say every pastor would be rich, every strip club owner would be poor. Doesn't work that way. There are poor pastors and there are rich strip club owners. Yes. So money has a mind of its own. And it's very important for people to learn and teach themselves and understand really how money works. Second, the error in fault is the thinking matters only to the degree that it then inspires and facilitates productive behavior. Okay? And finally, the thinking and the behavior is wasted to a great degree if the opportunity to use it in a way that will cause money to move to you is not created, managed, and pursued. Mm -hmm. So to be simplistic, you can have the best attitude in the world, you can have the worst attitude in the world. I can put two of you at a cosmetic counter in a department store. If nobody comes to the cosmetic counter, having the best attitude in the world is no advantage over the worst attitude in the world. At the end of the day, nobody's gonna sell a lips lipstick. Right. Okay? So if we don't have a means of putting you in front of people who could give you money, mm -hmm. if you had a good attitude, had good work habits, had good behavior, and had good sales skills, and were able to present yourself well, and had good products, I might as well let you have a crappy attitude. Go ahead, be miserable. Right. Okay? It isn't going to have any impact whatsoever. So that's the thing that's left out and it gets left out of that story all the time, candidly, because it's easier to sell the story with that left out. Right. Okay? Makes it's sense. A, it's a much happier story. Yeah. If we just leave that out. Yeah. I mean, Disney, we're here in Orlando, they, you know, happiest place on earth. Happy. I will tell you from having studied them to the nth degree and spent time with Imagineers and so forth, they are also the most micromanaged place on earth. <laughs> okay? So behind the castle, actually underneath the castle. Um, every number is being crunched. Every statistic of what do we spend to get people in here to do this? How many spent money this minute wow. on these pins? Gee, should we have it facing this way instead of facing that way? Gee, that woman who's doing pin trading with the kids, her numbers are not as good in this hour, on this day, under these weather conditions, in this place, wow. as this other one is. So we ought to have her go do something else, and we ought to have Helen come over here and pin trade where there's more traffic, on and on and on and on wow. and on. And so, yes, everybody wow. pretty much has a good attitude. <laughs> Every, everybody running Disney is, you know, they're, they're, they're positive thinkers, and everybody yeah. on the ground is happy. Yes. Okay? However... Everything is done to monetize all that happiness. Mm -hmm. And if we're not doing the stuff to monetize the way we think, mm -hmm. the way we behave, the products or services that we rent, the value we bring to exchange for money, if we don't have that other piece, the rest of it really doesn't matter. Makes sense.